be great help if you keep your Bibles open and with God's Word open. Let's pray for the help of the Spirit to understand these words and so that we can listen, we can comprehend, and that we can obey for the glory of Christ. Let's pray. Dear Father, we thank you so much for your great kindness to us. We pray today that you would open our eyes, our spiritual eyes and spiritual ears so that we know more about Jesus. The Bible teaches us that he is the greater Jonah. And so, Father, we do pray that lessons that we learn from this Old Testament book will show us more of Jesus and help us to live in the light of what Jesus has done. And we pray that for the glory of his name. Amen. Have you ever had one of those days... Do you know the kind of days that I mean? Initially, you wake up in the morning and you really want to get out of bed. It's one of those days when you have an exciting 24 hours ahead of you, and then it all goes wrong. Uh, The house is cold, you go downstairs, the kitchen is flooded, the cat has been sick, and then just as you're wondering if it can get any worse, you realize your car has been stolen. It is one of those days. Jonah was having one of those days. Now, admittedly, it was all his own fault. Um, He had deliberately run away from the mission of God. Do you remember God had told Jonah, you are my prophet, I am your commander-in-chief, and therefore what you shall do, I want you to go to Nineveh, and I want you to preach against them. Well, that's what Jonah was told very clearly of the Lord. It wasn't confusing, and yet Jonah decided and said that he would not go to Nineveh. Nineveh was east. Instead, Jonah said, I'm heading west, and I'm going to go to Tarshish. So God said, I want you to go that way. Remember, and Jonah said, no way, I'm going that way. And so he headed off to the coast, and he boarded a ship to Tarshish. And that's when disaster struck for him. God sends a huge, massive storm of life-threatening proportions. And then Jonah, remember, is interrogated by the pagan sailors, and as a result of the interrogation, he is thrown overboard into a raging sea. Without doubt, whatever definition you have of a bad day, I think that probably classifies as a bad day. The question is, can it get any worse? And at first sight, the answer seems to be yes. Now look at, again, at what we're told at the end of Jonah chapter 1, verse 17. The Lord provided a huge fish to swallow Jonah. And Jonah was in the belly of the fish three days and three nights. Now, it's worth saying in passing that this creature is never called a whale in the Bible. I know we've probably had too many children's cartoons and too many children's books, but in the Bible, it is never specifically called a whale. It might be, but it is always simply called a great or a huge fish. The question is, the important question is, why is it in the story? So in the verse that I've just read, we're told that, notice, the Lord provided it. So that's clear, isn't it? The Lord provided the great fish. And the intention of the Lord is for the fish to swallow Jonah and keep him alive inside the creature for three days and three nights. Now, I know this is a very unusual and a very dramatic incident, but let me give you a little tip as we pass through this. Don't waste your time trying to find stories of people who say they have survived something similar. There's no point, really. Those stories that you may find on a quick Google search may or may not be true, but it doesn't actually matter. Because here's the point. We mustn't make what is possible in a human story the mark of what is possible in a divine story. Okay, there's no point. Oh, yeah, I found this in Google, therefore this means the Bible can be true. That's a, that's a rubbish way around, isn't it? We mustn't make the standard of what is possible for human beings to be the standard of what is possible for God. God can do what he likes. Uh, We've already seen in chapter 1 that God controls what? We've seen in chapter 1 that God controls the storms. Uh, We've seen in chapter 1 that God controls the stones. Do you remember when they cast a lot and it lands on Jonah? God controls the storms, he controls the stones. Well, what we're being told now is that God controls all the creatures in the sea. 
And yet the question still remains, doesn't it? Why did God send the great fish to swallow Jonah? Is it another way of God punishing his disobedient prophet? Remember, by this point, Jonah is a disobedient prophet. Is it now he's had a storm to endure? Is it now that the Lord provides the great fish as a way of punishing his prophet even more? See how you like it then. See how you like spending three days and three nights in the belly of a great fish alive. Maybe that will bring you to your senses. Is that the point? Is God punishing his prophet? Well, not according to what we read next. The truth is that the fish is not an instrument of God's punishment, but an instrument of God's rescue of Jonah from certain death. And the rescue comes in response to Jonah's prayer for deliverance. Let me show you chapter 2, verse uh, 1. From inside the fish, Jonah prayed to the Lord his God, and he said, in my distress, I called, now notice past tense, I called to the Lord, and he answered me, where is the distress? From deep in the realm of the dead, I called for help, and you listened to my cry. You hurled me into the depths, into the very heart of the seas, and the current swirled about me. All your waves, notice it's all God's waves, God's completely in charge of this, all your waves and your breakers swept over me. I said, I have been banished from your sight, yet I will look again towards your holy temple. The engulfing waters threatened me, the deep surrounded me, seaweed was wrapped around my head. Do you see what's happening? He is sinking deeper and deeper into the ocean. He's been chucked into the sea, and he's going deeper and deeper and deeper. Verse 6, to the roots of the mountains, I sank down. The earth beneath barred me in forever. You see, he's kind of going down and down and down. But, but you, Lord my God, brought my life up. You see the difference? He's been going down and down and down, and then the Lord brought his life up. Why? Verse 7, when my life was ebbing away, I remembered you, Lord, and my prayer rose to you, to your holy temple. You see what's happening? He's going down and down. He's almost at the end of his life. He's at the bottom of the ocean, it seems. The seaweed is all around him. But then, almost at the last gasp, he remembers the Lord. At last, the prophet of the Lord speaks to God. Do you know, this is the first time in the entire book of Jonah when Jonah speaks in a heavenward direction. Up until now, we've heard him speak to the pagan sailors. The pagan sailors have been speaking to the Lord, but not Jonah. This is the first time that he prays. And what a place to pray. I don't know if you've prayed in strange situations. Uh, Jonah prays as he sinks to the bottom of the sea. Moments from certain death, he talks to God as the seaweed is wrapping around his head. It is a remarkable turnaround, isn't it? The rebellious prophet becomes, in a moment, the repentant prophet. He comes to his senses. He remembers the Lord. Notice, he remembers the Lord. He remembers the temple of the Lord. What does the temple of the Lord signify? It signifies that God is gracious and God wants to be with his people. It is a place of sacrifice and grace. And that is what Jonah remembers as his life ebbs away. And that triggers him. Even in this moment. Even though he has been disobedient. Because God is wonderfully gracious. He cries out to God. And as a response, the Lord provides the great fish. Now, it doesn't look like the Lord created the rescuing fish on the spot, as if God snapped his divine fingers and goes, right, you go then, there's the great fish. Now, he could have done that if he wanted to, but it seems that something else has happened God demonstrates his divine power and his divine knowledge by ensuring that this fish is in exactly the right place at exactly the right time and with exactly the right diet to want to swallow a dying prophet. <laughs> God knows what Jonah will do all along. It doesn't excuse Jonah's sin. And it doesn't nullify Jonah's need to cry out in prayer. But it does show you how awesome God is, isn't it? 
that he controls all the details of all the movements of the great fish so that at the very moment when Jonah is almost dead and he cries out to the Lord, the Lord says, ah, look what I prepared for you. Now, it's very obvious that using a ginormous fish to save a drowning man, you could say, is somewhat odd. It is somewhat an unusual way to bring salvation. But isn't this classic God? Again and again in the Bible, God goes out of his way to use strange methods to save his people. Think about the way he rescued his people from Egypt. The final plague, the the Passover, when the Lord would pass through, but he would pass over the houses of the Israelites on one condition. What was the condition? That he would pass over and they would not be punished with death, the firstborn. If, if what? If a lamb had been killed and the blood of the lamb had been painted on the doors. So the Lord was saying, okay, this is the way we're going to save you. We're going to put the blood of a lamb on the door. Okay. Interesting. Uh, What about when they're in the desert uh, and the people of God rebel and all the different snakes, the venomous snakes. Remember that? All the venomous snakes uh, are around. And what's the Lord's way of saving his people? He says to Moses, okay, what you're going to do is uh, get a a particular snake on the pole. And I want my people to look at the snake on the pole. And if they look at the snake on the pole, they'll not die. Wow, okay. That's the way it's going to be. Or think about the defeat of the city of Jericho. How are we going to do it? Are we going to march the armies in? We're going to get, we're going to get the latest technology. We're going to blitz down the walls. They're going to throw rocks at the walls. The best swords and shields. No, that's not what's going to happen, is it? What I want you to do is I want you to just kind of march around. <laughs> just keep on marching. And then blow your trumpets. <laughs> and then the walls come down. You see, there's a pattern in the Bible, isn't there? That God sets up the pattern again and again that he will use unusual and strange ways to save his people, not just once, but many, many times. And why is that? Because as you accelerate to the New Testament, what do you discover about the Lord's ultimate way of saving his people? What is the Lord's plan to save billions of human beings who are rebellious sinners against his rightful rule who deserve eternity in hell, what is the Lord's plan to save humanity? Look to the cross of Jesus Christ. One man lifted up on a Roman cross who if you look to Jesus Christ and you trust him as your savior, this one man dying on a cross will pay the price of billions of human people. (laughs) Strange, isn't it? (laughs) But it's classic God. Uh, Many people in our world today find it hard to believe. Many find it weak, pathetic. But for those of us who believe in Jesus, what do we know about the cross of Christ? It is the power and the wisdom of God to save. Now, before we look at Jonah's commitment to God, and he does make a commitment to God in the fish, uh, I want to say something about how this story so far applies to us. I want to say something maybe to those today, and I don't know who you are, but are there those gathered in this building or maybe listening or online who you, you consider yourself a bit of a hopeless case? I want to say something to you. And I want to say something to maybe those who maybe are waiting till the last minute, maybe later on in your life, before committing their lives to Jesus. So first, there is no such person as a hopeless case. No matter how messy your life is, no matter how big you think you have failed, God's eternal salvation is for you. Do you hear that? It's for you. God provides salvation for your sin. Jonah, I think we can safely say, was in a bad way. (laughs) Jonah was not a wonderfully good person that the Lord provided salvation for, Jonah was in a bad way, but what did we discover? That God's hand is never, ever too short to save. You cannot run in your badness so far from the Lord that he cannot grab hold of you and save you. But you need to pray. If you think you're so far from God and there is no place, God says there is a place for you. I have provided a savior for you, but learn the lesson from Jonah. The fish is waiting. Your savior is waiting. 
but you've got to cry out for help. Please save me. You could do it. You could even do it now as I continue to preach. If this is you, why don't you, in your mind, do business with God? Cry out for help. And what about the person that says, I'll live my life, and then just just at the end, then I'll turn to Jesus Christ. Of course, it can happen. Jonah is saved at the last minute. One of the criminals next to the Lord Jesus Christ dies. You know what I'm saying? He's getting strung up on a cross next to Jesus. He's a very, very nasty individual the Romans are crucifying. This guy cries out to Jesus at the last moment of his life, please forgive me, I want, I want to be in your kingdom. And Jesus says, today what? Today you'll be with me in paradise. That man has absolutely no time to make amends. This man has no time at all to live a good life. That very day, he is either heading to heaven or to hell, but because he cries out to Jesus, Jesus says, today you'll be with me in paradise. Can it happen at the last minute? Of course it can happen at the last minute. But let me say a couple of things. You have no idea if you will want to or if you will be capable of turning to Christ at the last minute. Don't play around with this. You have no idea of your final condition when you take your final breath. And you have no idea what your heart will be like on that day. It doesn't stay neutral. The more you delay, the further you go. But also, I just want to say, why would you want to delay? Why would you want to delay coming to Jesus Christ? Why would you want to put off experiencing the joy of knowing Jesus for what? A less fulfilled life. And so what happens if this is you and you're thinking, I just want to put it off and put it off. I just want to say to you, the Savior is waiting. Learn the lesson of Jonah and come and pray. So let's finish. Let me show you how Jonah finishes his prayer in chapter 2. Look at verse 8. He looks back, he's thankful, and now he looks forward in verse 8. Those, he says, who cling to worthless idols turn away from God's love for them. But I, with shouts of grateful praise, will sacrifice to you what I have vowed I will make good. I will say, salvation comes from the Lord. And what happens? First then, the Lord commands the fish, and it, I love that, I love that. and the fish vomits Jonah onto dry land. And next week, we'll discover what happens when he cleans himself up and as he goes to Nineveh. But he begins the section, doesn't he, by speaking about the link uh, between idols and God's love. Do you notice that? In short, he says that worshipping idols will cut us off from experiencing the secure and the satisfying love of God. Now, what is an idol? An idol is a false god. An idol is anyone or anything that we set our hearts towards rather than the true and living God. It is any other thing or any other person that we look to instead of God. People, things that get our attention and get our love and get our affection that only God deserves. Now, idols, they come and go, don't they? They change their shape. They change their form from culture to culture and from age to age. But all of humanity is worshipping something or someone. The question is not, do we worship? The question is, what do we worship or who? What are we living for? What are we sacrificing for? What are we devoted to? What are we looking to to provide our significance, our security, our satisfaction? What are we pinning? This is what are you doing? What are you pinning your hopes on to save you from living a pretty dismal, irrelevant life? Let's get this clear. Idols are vain. They are worthless. Idols take us away from the secure, supporting, and satisfying love of the God who is Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And that's what Jonah says. It seems that this point he is in a better place. Now, I know he's still inside a great fish, and that can't be very, very pleasant. But what is now, he's experiencing that fresh taste of God's goodness and of his grace. It is beginning to dawn on him. 
But running away from God doesn't lead you to joy and to happiness. Instead, running away from the Lord leads you to a life that is deeply fractured and doesn't connect with reality. But at this point, Jonah is no longer running. In fact, by this point, Jonah is no longer drowning. Jonah has experienced the Lord's quick and gracious salvation. Now, that leads him to make two future commitments. Did you notice what he says? But I will shouts of grateful praise will sacrifice to you what I have vowed I will make good. I will say salvation comes from the Lord. He says two things. He, he says he will sacrifice for the Lord, and he says he will speak for the Lord. He vows first to sacrifice for the Lord. He says, with shouts of grateful praise, I will sacrifice to you. I will allow your ways to impact my life in a way where I will feel the imprint. Do you notice that? Okay? That's what happens when you sacrifice. When you're not sacrificed, you never feel the imprint. But when you start to sacrifice, you begin to feel the impact and the imprint of what you do. That's what he says he's going to do for the Lord. But notice, this isn't a reluctant life of sacrifice. This is not him going, oh, yeah, better, all right, there's better go for it then. Don't really want to do it. Let's go for it. No, this is a joyful, willing sacrifice to God. He says, with shouts of grateful praise, I will be involved in sacrifice. The New Testament says this, doesn't it? Romans chapter 12, you know the great turnaround, 11 chapters of the book of Romans, talking about the, the wonderful grace of God going deep and deeper into doctrine. And how does it change at chapter 12? The word is therefore. Therefore, in the light of everything I have now written, Paul says, I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as what? As a living sacrifice. Holy and pleasing to God. That is your true and proper worship. So that is the Christian life, to live in devotion out of appreciation for the grace of God, where we say, I will do what you ask, God. I will trust in your mercy. I will rely on your mercy and grace. More than that, I will sacrifice. I will be a living sacrifice. That's what happens to Jonah. It's what has happened to us. And second, Jonah says, I will speak for the Lord. He says, I will say, salvation comes from the Lord. Do you notice the two aspects of the proclamation? First of all, we will say, he will say, we will say, salvation is required. You say salvation is from the Lord. The first thing you mean is that salvation is necessary. That is, there is such a category as sinners. We're all in it and we all need salvation. So what will not be pronounced from this church is that salvation is not required because we're all good people on the way to heaven. No, salvation is required. And second, salvation, where does it come from? Salvation comes from the Lord. And only from the Lord. From the God of Israel. From the God who sent his son, the Lord Jesus Christ, into the world. That is what we proclaim. Salvation is required. And salvation comes from Jesus. Now, this is still early days for Jonah. There are lots of unanswered questions. For example, how deep? How deep is the grace of God? How, how much has it traveled into Jonah's heart? It's traveled to his mouth, but does it go much deeper? Will he joyfully do whatever the Lord asks of him? Will he proclaim salvation to anybody, even to the Ninevites? And how will he respond if God graciously saves them? Well, you have to come back. <laughs> and if you're on holiday and you're only here for a week, extend your stay. <laughs> Don't miss out. Let's finish just by emphasizing the importance of personal gratitude as we participate in the mission of Christ. So we too are called to sacrifice for the Lord. We too are called to speak for the Lord, but we do need fuel for the journey. You may not be a mechanical expert in the ways of cars, but even Luddites like me understand that when the little petrol light goes on, and then when the little petrol light doesn't just go on, but starts to blink and flash, it's desperate, isn't it? Because when it runs out of fuel, the car goes nowhere. Likewise, we need fuel for the journey. 
A car goes nowhere without petrol, dear friends. Likewise, we go nowhere in our Christian life without deep personal gratitude for what God has done for us in Christ. Gratefulness to Jesus is the fuel for missions. So let's be praying. Let's be praying that God would give us a fresh appreciation of his saving grace. We need his help. We can do nothing on our own. But with the help of God, we will attempt great things for him. We will sacrifice and we will speak for Christ. Let's pray. Dear Father, we thank you so much for the mercy of Jesus, and we thank you so much for what we see of the salvation of Jesus in this story. We continue to pray that we would trust that you are powerful, that you are good, and that we would be quick to experience the fresh touch of your grace. Help us to realize afresh today that running away from you to worthless idols is a waste of time, and help us instead to enjoy your bountiful, deep, wonderful love. Amen.